Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is David Katz. I lead the Privacy, Cybersecurity, and Data Management Group here at Adams & Reese, and I'm very thrilled today to present to you the advanced strategies for managing privacy and data security compliance risk among legal and business teams. And I'm joined today with representatives from Assurian's legal and privacy team, and I'm thrilled about the program that we've put together for you today, and shortly I'll be introducing our guest on the screen. Um, in preparing this program, the objective was to provide you an overview of how an experienced and mature privacy program works in a major corporation in the United States. And so today I'm very pleased to introduce you to Gina Allen, uh, Tamara Hart, and Rob Rolfson. Um, Gina is a director and corporate counsel at Assurian. Ms. Tamara Hart is the vice president and associate general counsel at Assurian. And Rob Rolfson is the chief privacy officer at Assurian. Also joining us is Caitlin Amick from the firm, who is a paralegal and a certified information privacy professional. So I'd like to ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Uh, if you could, Gina, please. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. Uh, Gina Allen, I have been in with Assurian for about six years now. I am on Tamara's team, and I support the IT product organization uh, and the privacy and data security teams under our enterprise technology and security organization. Thank you. And Tamara? Hi, I'm Tamara Hart. Uh, I've been with Assurian for about 14 years. And uh, as Gina mentioned, my team supports all the backend operations, which includes the technology aspect of it. Uh, and I have been uh, working in the privacy area at Assurian since, uh, since, we, since we started one. Fantastic, and Rob? And Rob Rolfson, I've been with, Assur with Assurian for about eight years now. Uh, in addition, and I'm the chief privacy officer. In addition to privacy, I also oversee data governance and audit and compliance and vendor risk and a couple of the programs. And I'm part of the technology organization, so I report to the CIO. Thanks, Rob. And Caitlin. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Amick. I'm a paralegal in Adams and Reese's Atlanta office. I'm also a certified information privacy professional for both the United States and European Union. Uh, I work with David Katz in responding to client inquiries about what data security law says and how they can realistically apply it to their businesses. Thanks, Caitlin. So we've designed this program today to really be functioning as a conversation, and many companies now are being challenged with uh, an explosion of privacy regulations, of issues around protecting uh, corporate information and personal information of their customers, and um, all, all of the regulatory requirements that have come online in the last few years. And companies are really struggling with how to develop these programs, how to integrate them uh, among their business teams, how to encourage their leadership uh, to take these programs uh, very seriously and to implement compliance requirements. And so um, we're, we're really pleased that Assurian has been willing to join us today to talk about how they're addressing all these requirements. And I'm gonna be directing these questions to the entire group. And the first question is, that Assurian has a mature uh, privacy program in place. And I think many people out there would like to understand, um, how did you develop this program from inception till today? And what were some of the key drivers that were in place uh, as you established the program? Um, how did it become an area of focus for the company? Um, and, and, and how did you think it would evolve over time from where it started, from where it is today? So I'll just open the discussion up with that question. Uh, so when we first started um, concentrating on privacy, it was an extension, I think, of some of the work we had previously done um, as, uh, you know, basically we were uh, selling insurance. And so uh, there were a lot of regulatory uh, restrictions around the way we handled data. And then we moved into the technology field and I think our senior leadership decided at that point we needed, uh, as we started providing tech support and other digital services that we needed to expand our core competency. And as part of that, Rob really stepped into, uh, into the field uh, and he is uh, our resident expert. And at that point, um, I will let Rob take over from what we did after after recognizing we needed somebody uh, to be the point person. 
Thanks, Tamara. So yeah, as Tamara you know, talked about, we've always had a culture of compliance at Assurian, uh, driven by regulatory and client contractual requirements and strong executive support maintaining these programs. But as our products started to evolve, we started collecting more and more consumer data. We recognized the criticality of ensuring that appropriate protections were in place. So when we started to build out the program, we recognized we really need some outside support. So we hired a third party to come in and do a gap P assessment uh, against AICPA, CICA guidelines and come up with a prioritized list of items for us to remediate, which really helped you know, drive that with the executives. And shortly thereafter, uh, new Japanese privacy law came into play. And we recognize you know, the criticality of that, but also that it provides for some exceptions with regards to APEC CBPR certification, which is a certification that Assurian sought and received uh, to facilitate the transfer of data between Asia PAC uh, economies. And we're the 19th US uh, company to get that certification, which really helped to mature the program. And then of course, GDPR came along, followed shortly thereafter by CCPA, and then also we've always had PIPIDA requirements up in Canada. Uh, and so combining these along with our you know, client requirements have really helped to continuously mature the program uh, to try and maintain that culture of compliance that we have here at Assurian. Great. Gina, did you want to add anything to that? or? No, I don't think I could add anything of value to that. That was great. So one of the things I want to pick up on that you mentioned, Tamara, that I think is a really interesting point for those folks that are thinking about developing their program is it was actually the way that the business was innovating uh, and beginning to take on new sort of opportunities uh, in the development of the product that caused them to focus in on um, are there other requirements that we need to consider in order to make our product competitive or in order to be competitive. Um, so maybe you can speak to a little bit about how compliance ultimately um, you know, became part of the evolution of the business as the products developed and new requirements were in place and how, that, how that's help, helped uh, align with innovation. Sure, thanks. Uh, I think that as, uh, as an insurance uh, company, we, there were already so many regulations around how we could use the data and uh, the, 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 the safety and the security around the data. And I don't know that we really thought too much about the privacy and, uh, and how that differed from securing the data. Um, but our clients who are uh, large retail chains and wireless community providers uh, understood uh, the privacy aspect of that and who owns the data and how that data is not only secured, but also, also uh, the disclosures and privacy requirements. And as we moved out of this heavily regulated insurance services to provide technology services uh, on both uh, phone calls, digital <laughs> platforms, mobile applications. Uh, I think the company as a whole understood that in this new world, there were compliance aspects that we had not previously been subject to. Um, well, we'd probably been subject to, but had just, because we had complied with the insurance regulations, uh, we hadn't worried too much about them. And in this new world, uh, they did recognize the head of our product organization, our general counsel, and the head of our technology, our CIO, all recognized that this was an area that had to be a core competency of assuring just like every other aspect of the services we provide. Great. So, Rob, this question is for you. You know, maybe in an organization that is not as mature or where, you know, innovation didn't require, you know, some addressing of these kinds of issues, what advice would you have to folks that are trying to get a seat at the table to be involved in discussions that may involve data or regulations around data where maybe the management team hasn't been educated on these issues or they're not as up to speed on these kinds of concerns? Yeah, good question. So, knowledge. You know, knowledge of the implications of non-compliance, knowledge of how much easier it is to build privacy and security into a product up front 
as opposed to retrofitting down the road and dealing with ramifications uh, you know, at go live time. Uh, helping people understand how being involved is actually a business differentiator and will help ensure that the company earns and maintains that customer trust, which is so critical for all of us to you know, keep our consumers. For those people that might be out there that have decided to focus on this issue or they have the responsibility for this issue in-house, but they feel like for whatever reason, they just can't break through with the management team and get the needed buy-in. Um, maybe this isn't doesn't sound like it's a problem for Assurian, but what advice do you have for other lawyers or other people working in-house that might be having some trouble breaking through? Yeah, yeah good question. So I go back to what I said initially, was that we had a third party, independent third party, who was recognized and supported by our executive team to come in and do a gap assessment and identify where we stood from a maturity perspective and how that compared to other companies in our space and other technology companies too. And so seeing how we compared and what and understanding what those gaps were and the potential implications I thought was critical to having those executives on board. So Tamara and I, when we kicked this all off, that was part of the strategy, was helping the executives understand why this is important and why this is not just a nice to have, it, but it really is critical from a trust perspective. Gina, a question for you. I mean, in your practice, I know you were very close to your product teams uh, and working with them um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis to, to integrate their ideas and to bring them to the market. Um, how do you how do you um, work with these teams and get them to understand some of these compliance risks where there may be some initial resistance or where they may not you know fully be excited to hear from a corporate lawyer about things that could slow the project down or are not so exciting? How do you how do you do that? Sure. So I usually we have journey teams at Assurian and they're sort of very focused small group teams in the product organization that um, each have a feature or an entire product construct they're trying to launch and sitting with those teams has helped me build relationships with them. Um, it's really hard to get someone to care about something that they don't know anything about. So sitting with them gives me the opportunity to explain the importance of privacy and not just the laws like rob and tamra mentioned earlier assurian's very interested in compliance but we don't stop there we're not interested in just the minimum level of compliance we're interested in proving to customers that we're a trusted advisor and that helps with customer engagement they want to reach out to us more to help them with issues especially tech support products that we provide so when I'm able to sit with those teams and explain that they are very invested in customer experience to have that continued engagement, that's what makes their team successful. Being able to explain how that customer experience is enhanced through respecting people's privacy, being extremely honest, um, open disclosures, clear disclosures, trying not to use all the legalese, and I'll admit a lot of times I do, and the product organization has to flower up what my message is to a customer. But uh, it's it's really, it's been successful for me. They're more interested, and a lot of times that means that the journey team will escalate things on their side to their leadership and their superiors and push the value of privacy. And in a way, they've helped me that way to push that message through the enterprise. Tamara, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but that everything that Gina just said um, is is really a key um, component of being a good in-house attorney and being a good in-house lawyer, establishing that trust, that integrity among those teams. I wonder if you could if you could just speak to that as well. Um, I will first say that Gina has the patience of Job. She really uh, has developed. Uh, some great relationships with the product teams. And there are a lot of product teams uh, at Assurian. We are constantly innovating and constantly coming up with new features and new ideas. And um, it is sort of a, a carrot in the stick all the time uh, where you want uh, to have these good relationships that people want to come to you. Um, 
and there is a little bit of if you if you haven't run this by legal and privacy then you get stopped and pushed back so uh you know there's both sides of that um additionally i think that uh <laughs> if you're not trusted if you're if you're constantly saying no and you're not you're not helping them with uh education and and the why behind it and that's where gina's patience comes in to say you have to be able to explain to them why this matters and so that it's it, they don't come to you all the time and you're saying wrong rock bring me another rock it is they are learning and developing and so the next time they bring an idea to you they've already baked in the advice that you've already given them so it's a two-way street there as well fantastic rob do you have a perspective on that just as the privacy officer sort of this in a similar vein yeah well it's all connected to like tamara said is trust you know, gina has done a fantastic job of earning the trust of the development team and so they know that she is there to help their, them make their job easier. And from a privacy perspective, she's helping to navigate through all these privacy issues that come up as part of their daily daily development opportunities or development uh, projects. And so it's all based on trust. We trust each other. At the you know the privacy team and the legal team are incredibly close. We work very close together all day long. And we know each other's pain points and we can help attack them from different points and help ensure that the business understands them too. Yeah, I, I think a lot of, um, you know, for, for folks out there that are, are trying to work on these relationships, um, you know, oftentimes they're really working to try and add value into the product. So are there examples that you can think of of, of times where maybe the, the situation initially looked like it was going to be difficult and then it turned out that in working with those teams, you ended up building a better product or coming up with a better solution and the final result is a, is a result of the cooperation and work? Absolutely. Uh, once we got more involved with our development teams, uh, a lot of times they create a concept, uh, I guess the best way to explain it's ideation phase. Like they woke up Monday, they came up with this fantastic idea and they wanna have the whole thing launched by Friday. Working with them, Sometimes launching the whole thing by Friday means it's going to be either non-compliant or super high risk. And like Tamara was saying, then we have to say, stop, stop. Now you've got to go back to the beginning and start over at ideation phase, because if we'd been involved, we could have mapped this out for you. So being able to tell them, uh, why don't we start with a minimum value product for a limited amount of time with a limited amount of customers that we test with? So it's not going to be the big bang we'll get there. And while you guys are launching your minimum value product, we'll work on the compliance issues to get you where you want to be at the end of it all. I've found they're mostly interested in feedback analysis. They're not looking to come up with the next best thing in five days. They want to start something and build on it and get to the next best thing over time. So, being a part of those meetings to be able to tell them let's start with something smaller that's not as high risk and while you guys are testing that out we'll get you where you want to be down the road uh, they're pretty receptive to that we've been uh, we've been lucky there excellent anybody else want to want to add anything to that or so so we've been talking um about how you interact with the, yeah yeah <laughs> we've been talking about how you interact with the business teams but I think another um, piece of information that would be useful is how you all communicate among each other because there's there's a corporate privacy team and then a legal team and I think the way that you all uh, work together would be interesting um, and how you communicate and, and just what your process is if you're dealing with, with some of these challenges internally. I think that'd be useful for others to hear. Well, I think Rob did a, a, he was referred to us in the past as family. And like he said earlier, we're very close. I think that's a great description. We spend a lot of time together. We have meetings on a daily basis with one another. And um, because we are in separate departments, people reach out to us separately. So I've found, I usually find out about individual product ideas before the privacy team does. And the privacy team usually finds out about 
larger enterprise-wide projects that we're working on before I do. Uh, regular meetings, uh, sit together, get lost in the weeds with each other. I used to go sit with the privacy team when we were all going to an office. I would sit with them once, twice a week and just hash through things with them to learn what the day-to-day -day was for them, what the back-end operations were, how they followed the data throughout the enterprise. And that was an invaluable experience. They were very welcoming. They even gave me my own little desk area. And uh, we, we spent a lot of time together hashing things out, issue spotting with one another, spitballing in a room and highlighting things. And that's that made a huge difference in how we interacted with each other and in how quickly we were able to resolve other departmental issues and bring them to the finish line. I also, I also think I just want to add that there's a, uh, there's this idea that uh, you know every department sort of stays in their lane, and um, I, I, I don't think there's a lot of ego involved in our two areas, and that. Uh, I, I have absolutely no problem deferring to Rob's expertise in the privacy world and his team is second to none. And uh, I think that they've developed a, a world-class privacy department and organization. They are, you know, wicked smart. And I, I absolutely will tell senior team, you got to run this by Rob's organization. Um, so I, I think it's healthy if both sides believe that and believe that uh, there is value add from every aspect and set your egos aside and recognize that there are subject matter experts, but, and especially hard for lawyers to recognize that there might be subject matter expert outside of the legal department. I appreciate that. Well, not a paid endorsement. Um, <laughs> and it goes both ways because what we have found is that as we work so closely together. We help each other understand our own concerns and you know, we all improve, we all benefit from that experience. And then additionally, by virtue of the fact that I'm part of technology, we do get pe uh, people coming to us who may not come to legal because you know they're afraid of going to legal, but they view us as being part of the technology organization. So they don't feel as badly sharing and disclosing things, which then, help them become more compliant. Yeah, so I, I, I think the big takeaway slide is, um, Tamara, what you said, which I think is critical, is leaving egos at the door, to not be siloed, to be cross-functional, uh, and to have a trust family approach, um, and that making all the difference in the world in terms of the success and being helping the business um, move forward. So. Um, so when you when you get something thorny, who typically does the first analysis? Is it is it legal news first and then privacy, or do you all? Um, it, it really just depends, I guess, on who who gets it first yeah. and then the sharing involved. Yeah, the deep dive though usually, uh, you know, there could be an initial review, but the deep dives are always go to the privacy team if it's a privacy issue. And and legal has a lot of other aspects and issue spotting, as as Gina said. Uh, we have a lot of client contract requirements that um, that we spend a lot of time making sure that we're in compliance with our insurance regulations, our client contracts. Um, and if there's somebody else out there who will take the privacy aspect off our shoulders for a little bit, let them do that deep dive. Gosh, you know, <laughs> we are so thankful. <laughs> So um, one question I have is that a lot of in-house counsel that I talk to, they're facing a tremendous amount of pressure to have an answer for the business teams right away. Um, it seems like you get presented with a question and oftentimes they want an answer and they may not understand or appreciate the deep dive that has to happen. Um, so I was hoping some of you could speak to how you manage their expectations and how do you tamp them down sometimes if that's necessary. I can jump in. I guess I get a lot of those phone calls. Um, so going back to what I'd said previously about trying to put them in stages, start with the minimum value product, a pilot period, a minimum amount of customers. Uh, that's not 
always successful. That's not always what they're looking for. Setting expectations, uh, it can be very difficult, um, but people are receptive to the idea of what's going to keep us out of trouble, what's going to keep our reputation uh, where it needs to be and where it is now. And no one wants to risk that. Uh, Assurian takes integrity very, very seriously. And I think when you explain to business partners, look, the risks here aren't worth it. And that's part of the analysis. What is the risk assessment here? How high is it? How low is it? And making sure the people who have to answer the phone calls when something has gone wrong know what those risks are and are comfortable with them, getting in those meetings, uh, setting up those phone calls with executive members. It's not, it's not impossible. It can be difficult, but people are receptive when you explain to them, look, it's not worth right. the risk here. It's not worth Assurian's reputation here. Um, they'll they'll fall in line and they they agree with us. There's not a lot of battle that I get with those issues. Yeah, you know, Gina, that's a great point. I would add that over the years we've built out this very robust risk management program to help ensure that you know all risks are made based you know based upon an informed decision, and so that we we identify any potential risk, whether it's privacy or something else, and bring it to the ultimate decision maker uh, and make sure that they're fully informed. And that then leads to better understanding, better planning, fewer last minute fire drills where they wanted, they need something done by the end of the day because they understand that sometimes some of these things take time and there needs to be a thoughtful analysis and uh, the appropriate parties brought in. Yeah, Caitlin, I would just add that the answer was pretty much in your question when you say, how do you manage the expectations? And that is, you know, uh, under promise and over deliver. <laughs> so uh, that's a lot of managing the expectations. Um, so, and our senior leadership and our partners, our business partners are, um, they're usually very reasonable about it. Um, but I do think that if you, if you manage their expectations at the outset and make sure you hit those promises of delivery, then there are, most people are okay with that. They just want to know where you are in the process. Got it. So we, we talked about uh, managing expectations in terms of work product. I, I guess I want to shift a little bit to, um, to focus on the communication of risk um, and how, um, I think for many in-house lawyers, they struggle with, in, in some cases, you know, finding themselves in a position where it feels like the business is asking them to make the decision about the risk components. So how do you deal with a situation where you're communicating the risk and maybe there's either there's a lot of pushback or it just doesn't seem, um, you know, that there's going to be a resolution to these issues that you've raised. I think for young lawyers or for, for all lawyers, it's really interesting to get that perspective on, on how that gets managed, risk communication, risk decision-making, business decision-making. So if you can offer any kind of perspective on that, I think it would be hugely useful. I think uh, at, in a legal department, I can only recall uh, one type of, of, of of risk that we would absolutely say no you can't do this and that if it, if the risk was what you're trying to do is against the law and it's a criminal aspect um uh if you think about you know ip infringement right i mean that's that's a problem and um there aren't that many areas of risk that are, you know, red flag, no go, you know, there be dragons kind of issues. Most of them are risks, and you you do have to have faith in your senior leadership and your business leaders uh, that they will take what you say seriously, and that you haven't overinflated the risk historically, and that you're very pragmatic about it. Um, and and let them assess and i would say 99.9% .9 of the time if we have uh, if we have grave concerns and have raised some risks our senior team will believe us and they'll go back to their 
product organizations or their technology organizations and, and ask them to minimize those risks. So that's sort of been my experience, but I'll let Gina and Rob come up with any experiences you guys have had. Go ahead, Rob. Uh, you first. Well, I was focused more, David, on the part of your question about what do you do when the business is trying to get legal to make the risk decision for them? Uh, I've found in my experience, when those moments happen, it means I haven't competently done my job. I haven't explained, provided examples, really waited out uh, for the executive that's in the position to make that decision. Usually, if I have done my job right, they have no qualms with making that decision. And sometimes, you know, you can't help it. You're human. You can hear the bias in my voice when I'm like, you know, this isn't the worst situation. I think we could do this. And they they catch that and they see, right. okay, so I'm not going to be the one on the chopping block with my face on the front page of the news, you know? Right. So it's uh, it goes back to developing relationships. Be comfortable going to your executive leadership and asking, especially as a young attorney, because that can be very nerve wracking. You know, when you are scheduling a call with a senior vice president or our COO, because you want to explain something to them, that can be a scary moment, but in my experience at Assurian, it's been very validating and they've been very receptive. If anything, they've been very grateful and I get very positive feedback for taking that 10 minutes of their time to walk them through the risks or my concerns so they feel like they're making a more competent decision. And that's all purely due to the trust that you've established over the years. The trust that they have that you're coming completely objectively with the facts and that there's no biases involved. You're trying to help the company make the right decision. And also to your point, Dave, or your question about legal making the decision, I would probably say that in most cases, legal is not the final decision maker on a risk. What we typically do is we go back to who would be the, the party or the team is best positioned to deal with this or would bear the ultimate impact. And if it's a client issue, it typically is someone on the client services side. So they're the ones who would make that end decision fully enforced with input from legal and compliance with everyone else. Excellent. So I think Kaylin has some questions about uh, training. Oh, sure. Um, we've talked a lot about Assurian's compliance program and how evolved it is. So I was wondering when it comes to training Assurian's own employees and its officers on data privacy issues, um, what mechanisms you use and how do you go about making it more than just a check the box exercise that people go through once a year and don't think about it? Yeah, I'll take that one. So, you know, you know, we keep talking about this culture of compliance. Part of that is grounded on the annual uh, protecting Assurian training that all employees take, which has data privacy components to it. Uh, it and then also based upon your unique role, for example, a call center employee might have more detailed, more specific training that talks about some of the, you know, the situations that they might encounter data and what their obligations are there. Uh, on top of that, we've got a couple other programs that we have. So for example, we have something called the Privacy Champions. And the Privacy Champions are a group of about 50 individuals who have been identified and volunteered uh, across a company who have an interest in privacy. And these individuals are provided specialized training and networking opportunities to work with the privacy team and the legal team. And they're basically our first line of defense help to implement privacy by design and security by design. Uh, with the privacy champions, we meet regularly and share information and they collaborate. We've done some gamification with the champions to where points are awarded based upon their level of participation with the organization. We're in the process of setting up a privacy university program where we're going to be 
community incentivizing the champions to do research on and produce small video vignettes on various privacy topics to try and help drive accountability, knowledge, collaboration, and establishing a platform for our champions to communicate and share discussions and comments and you know, feedback on privacy components. Additionally, we have a security guild where the security team uh, have consult security consultants who work with the uh, various product teams around the company to help develop secure and uh, private and privacy in the products. Additionally, we have a shirt uh, awareness week. So every January we have privacy awareness month, but we celebrate a week. A month is 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 a for, is a little bit too long for us with everything else going on. And during that week, we generally culminate with um, an event uh, with a with a game. And so, for example, last year we had privacy squares based upon Hollywood squares, and Tamara here was the center square. It was very entertaining. Uh, in the past, we've done. Jeopardy on privacy. We've done Family Feud. We've done ten thousand dollar pyramids. We make it fun, and we have really good turnout for these events because it's so much fun. And they learn a little bit about privacy. They also learn who to come to when they have a question, and that's what we want. They're not going to remember the question that was the five hundred dollar what is PII Jeopardy question, but what they hopefully will remember is that there is a privacy team who can answer these questions if they come up. So we, and then lastly, we have a hackathon at Assurian every year. And in that hackathon, we have virtual teams of employees who come together with different ideas about new products, new processes, et cetera. And in those hackathons, privacy uh, is always a resource, meaning that we have a table where people can come and are encouraged to come and explore and probe their idea on what are the privacy implications and what needs to be done to better manage any privacy risk there. Uh, so there's a lot of education and awareness. We do a lot with executives too. We send out weekly emails of regulatory updates and, and case law that comes up, comes up around the world. Um, it's, it's constant education and awareness. We do quarterly global surveys on uh, regulatory changes by, by country. A lot of stuff going on. And kind of as a follow-up to that, Rob, could you talk more about who your team is made up of and what resources they rely on maybe for putting together um, those resources about the changing laws and regulations? Are, is your team made up of lawyers? Does everyone on your privacy team have a legal background? Yeah, yeah, we're primarily lawyers or reformed lawyers. Uh, and we subscribe to a couple of regulatory tracking services to you know keep up with those reg regulatory changes. We also are an IAPP gold member and so we get a lot of benefits from that and we provide a lot of our employees access to that IAPP resource. Um, and you know, we find that having a legal background is really helpful in privacy, not so much because of the JD, but because the process you've gone through as an attorney and having that inquisitive mind and wanting to understand why. And you know, being a good active listener which goes back to why Gina's so successful because she listens to the product teams and she understands what they're trying to do. And by truly listening and not having the answer before they ask the question, she's able to add tremendous value to their programs. Thank you. If I didn't know any better with all this positive feedback, I'd say I'm in line for a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think there have been some some really great insights here, and I think I want to ask you when you're recruiting, when you're looking for people to join your team, what are the kinds of things that you're you're looking for in folks, either on the privacy side or and on the legal side? Well, what's important to you, and how how do you assess whether someone's going to be successful in um, doing all the things that you've very clearly laid out or required to be successful? Um, for the legal team, the first thing, uh, and I, I think that Assuring is not unique in this, in the legal world, you, you look for somebody with some integrity, a lot of integrity, quite frankly, um, and, and that's a, a core value at Assuring is that we act with integrity. So, you know, sometimes that can be hard, hard to assess in an interview process, but um, 
it, I think it's something that, you know, everyone in our legal department, thank goodness, has in, uh, in, in, in large doses. So we're very thankful for that. Um, the other aspect, I think for Assurian specifically, is the ability to work quickly um, and not be reactive. And I think what Rob said about listening, being an active listener, being inquisitive, asking questions, not making assumptions. Uh, and, and all of those things I think uh, are, are, are definitely on display with Rob's privacy team uh, and, and Gina and her team and, and the way that we work with our business partners in that regard is that you, you do have to be, you do have to be patient to develop those relationships. And part of that is you have to listen to them and, and hear what they have to say. Um, and in the interview process, you can tell almost immediately if someone is not listening to your questions. So that's, <laughs> that's a good tell. <laughs> yeah, on, on top of that, on the privacy side, in addition to the patients and a good listener, an inquisitive mind and wanting to understand. We also do look at the IAPP certifications, which are a good demonstration of interest in privacy and that body of knowledge and wanting to understand more. Um, and so those certs are a good indicator for me. Um, we can teach you a lot of things about technology, about Assurian, but that, that thought process is something that we can't teach you. Great. So this has been a just a fascinating discussion, and I think there's been a, a lot of good uh, insights shared. Um, and I think before we start taking questions, maybe the last question um, is, what do you see on the horizon in terms of risk, or what concerns you the most from a technology perspective, whether it's for Assurian's business or just the way people are doing business in general uh, on, in these topics? I mean, I, I assume you've thought maybe some about sort of what does the future bring like AI, for example, or deep fakes or things like that. Is there anything that sort of keeps you up at night about how will this evolve and, and what are the risks of the future? Just uh, we want to just wildly speculate or open it up in that regard. I think Rob had a really good point today about uh, part of our technology services is we we want to help the whole family with your technology. And as part of that, uh, we are sort of creeping into a new little area uh, where we might get children's data. And I think that that's an area that is very concerning to us uh, because I do think it's a focus. Um, and Rob, I, I mean, he pointed that out this morning in an email to me. Um, about uh how it's just a it's it's more of a focus these days yeah yeah I, I think there's really a balance in trying to serve a consumer in terms of what do they want um and and how much are they willing to to provide in order to get the services and everybody's constantly having to make that evaluation in light of you know all of the restrictions that might apply or all the compliance components to that so i, I think it's for everyone that's involved in any kind of consumer interaction you know, that's a balance, right? I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Robert. Yeah, well, I would also say there's friction there because mm -hmm. consumers wanting that benefit of having Siri being able to predict what they're going to want, but you don't want, you know, that technology to have all that data. And so it's a constant checks and balances between what you want and wanting those services that are provided by having all that data out there about you. But yet being creeped out by that, as well as on top of that, in that overlay of the you know patchwork state regulatory requirements we have, and then also looking at the EU and will there be a Schrems three? You know, we see Schrems two coming down. What a you know, what's gonna be next from the EU and how further back will they curtail that and how will that impact you know the work we do in the EU? Oh, great point. So we're going to open it up to questions from the attendees. If you have a question, you can go ahead and submit it, and we'll we'll ask it for the group. We've got a little bit over ten minutes, so we've saved ourselves some time. Um, and if there 
not many questions, we can maybe carry on the conversation or let everyone get back to their day a little bit early. So um, let's see if some of these questions come in. Um, it doesn't look like we have any in the queue at the moment. <laughs> so uh, maybe we've covered we've, everything. Maybe we've answered everything. Well, we'll give it a, a few more seconds, but I just want to say um, how much we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all and um, and what we know and what you've shared today about the program. I think it's a great guide for anybody that wants to, to learn more about this space and anybody that's trying to develop their own in-house program, um, you know, to use sort of this as guidance and how that gets done. And then really interacting with business teams and all of the issues that lawyers and, and business people on the privacy side face trying to do their jobs well um, and if there's anything else you want to add um, while we're sort of waiting on questions you know be happy to talk about other topics yeah, yeah. well david you you talked about getting started you know one of the things that we neglected to mention is that if someone's looking to get started in this at a corporate level look at data flows understand what data do you collect what do you do with that data who do you share it with and then that will help you understand the controls that are required for that data. I think a lot of people find that data is collected that is not needed and introduces additional risk into the system. And having that common taxonomy across your company on what is PII, because until you really have that conversation, you don't really know because you'll find a lot of people think PII is not quite as extensive and broad of a definition as it actually is. And they might think it's just credit cards and passports, but it, you know, as we all know, it's much, much more than that. And so it's critical to have that common understanding of what it actually is. So we do have a question, um, and the question really, the, the the key element of this question is, how do you determine how big your privacy team or your legal team should be with respect to these issues? Is it a function of how large the company is or how small the company is? How did you decide? Uh, the makeup of your team and how many people you needed and uh, in order to be effective given the size of your organization. Yeah, so it started with me. <laughs> yeah. With strong support from Tamara and Gina, over time, as I'm, we're a metrics driven company. So over time, as we've collected and prepared metrics demonstrating the amount of the volume we're seeing, and the value we add, we're able to demonstrate the value in having incremental resources dedicated to the program. So you start off, and it and it depends upon you know the nature of the risk and the data that you have, and what are those requirements you're trying to deal with. Great. I think, um, I think the answer for the for the legal department is we never have enough people in the legal department from sure. a legal standpoint. From the business standpoint, there are always too many people in the legal department. So Except if you're if if you're an in-house counsel, you know that that's the truth is that the business thinks there are too many lawyers, and the lawyers think there are not enough. Um, but as Rob says, you do kind of have to use the metrics and say, hey, there's you know 50 journey teams and there's one Gina. Do you guys want this to happen faster? We need more Ginas. So. Very good, yeah. So another question we have is, um, you know, executives are often faced with trying to balance all kinds of compliance and legal risks. Um, I guess in a company that where maybe um, privacy isn't being prioritized or security isn't being prioritized, um, what, what do you think is maybe the most compelling line of argument of why these issues should be either prioritized or um, have their own sort of unique focus apart from everything else that's going on? That's a, I think that's a good question. We do this all the time uh, when uh, I, I think uh, people who get to the to the positions of CIO or COO, um, I, I think the standard question is always, "What's the worst that can happen?" Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, what's the risk of us actually getting caught? And all those aspects, I think you have to balance those things out. Uh, and there's a risk that 
maybe you won't get caught. Maybe you're such a small fish in a big sea and maybe you won't. But if you do, um, it's going to be all over the place and you're going to lose your credibility. And there's almost nothing that will destroy your credibility faster than uh, a, a data breach. <laughs> I, I mean, it is. Uh, it, it cripples big companies and small companies. It cripples big companies. It destroys small companies. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's a lot of those uh, examples out there uh, that, you know, maybe the risk is small, but the, <laughs> the, the, the consequence is huge. Uh, yeah. And those kinds of issues as well. And building on that, something else that we did in the early days is we're trying to you know, strengthen the executive support for the program. And part of that education component, we did tabletops, where we had a tabletop situation to help the executives understand the actual impacts and how quickly things can go to hell in a handbasket during a data breach. And that was pretty eye-opening, especially when we had other third parties come in and conduct it for us. Um, and it yeah, you have a lot of people come to you with uh, with issues and say things like, this company's doing it, so why can't we? Or that company's been successful with it, why can't we try it out? And I think also trying to uh, balance sharing your viewpoint on the difference between a company like Asherian and a startup company and what each company has to lose, pointing those things out. Uh, sort of sets the expectations like Tamara and Rob are saying with the, especially with reputation. Do you really want to risk our reputation on what is essentially a side hustle for the month to see how it works out? Yeah, no, it's very good. Um, yeah, so I think we put that on a risk heat map too. We quantify those risks a lot of times and put them on a heat map or graphically depict that to the executive. So this will be our final question, but uh, we have a, someone asking about um, becoming a certified information privacy professional. And I guess, how do you integrate, and this is probably for Caitlin too, um, and Rob, you know, how do you integrate that person into your team and what, what are they, um, how valuable is that, is someone with that kind of certification, that knowledge in terms of the day-to-day -day activity, um, you know, on, on your team, or if you uh, bring somebody like that onto the team? I'll go first and talk about um, how I got certified. So the IAPP um, has different certifications, one for the US and one for the EU, as well as several others. Um, it involves for each, there's a test. Um, there is a book that you get that goes over the whole world of rel potentially relevant laws and regulations. And then you have to go in and take the test. Um, and then it's a a, a biannual CLE um, requirement that goes along with it. So I watch webinars in a non-COVID world. I would hopefully go to seminars um, to stay up to date um, on what's happening um, in the relevant jurisdictions. Um, and then I'll kick it over to Rob and hopefully he can talk about how he uses people like me on his team. Yeah, so people with the IAPP certifications have a base foundational knowledge or a demonstrated foundational knowledge on privacy requirements and the privacy and the processes we go through and evaluating those risks and those frame privacy frameworks um do you have to have the certification no uh you can you know but having that is what is important and so having that certification is a clear demonstration that you have the knowledge Otherwise, we you know you have to talk to someone and figure out you know do you know you know the ten steps to this or or whatever what are the notification requirements why is consent important etc. Uh, so the certifications are good and there's a whole slew of certifications from the IAPP. As Caitlin said, there is a there's several need for the U.S. There's the U.S. There's a U.S. government. There's an EU. There's an Asia. There's a certified information privacy manager. And then from a technical perspective, there's a certified information privacy technologist, which gets a little bit deeper in the technology side. Uh, I highly recommend them because it's it's a good introduction. Uh, there is some studying required, but it's not it's not that difficult. I think with enough time, you can figure it out. 
<laughs> I just want to thank everyone again. We're we're right at the almost at the top of the hour, and unless anyone has anything else to add or share, I think that will conclude the presentation. And I want to thank each one of you so much for being willing to share your time and all of your great knowledge uh, about how things work in practice and at a great company like Asherian. So thanks to all our panelists and thank you everyone for joining us and we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, David. Thank you, David.